Okay, here we go, Discord and uh, TikTok. And he said, update the TikTok app. Okay. Oh, my Screw God. Screw you, TikTok. All right, I'm going to run the countdown. Here we go. <laughs> You are watching the skeptic's guide to the universe, your escape to reality. Yep. Anything different <laughs> with the setup today? <laughs> Who can tell? Uh, no, <laughs> coming out. Jay, where are you, Jay? Jay is only here virtually today. I am at my. I am broadcasting from my house. Uh, my children had a half day today because it's parent-teacher conference day, mm -hmm. and I got their report cards. This is very non-entertaining information. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> How'd they do? Doing all right. They both do do great uh, scholastically. Yeah. Um, but my son. Um, doesn't <laughs> just doesn't want to listen to what the teachers ask him to do. Mm -hmm. He's very rambunctious. That's a good non-judgmental word. Rambunctious. Yeah, it's a good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> High energy. Hey from Denver. Hello, Denver. Uh okay, we got YouTube and Twitch going. YouTube, TikTok Twitch, being, TikTok, yeah, and TikTok Discord. Is... Is slowly How about updating. Facebook? Do we do Facebook? Yeah, Facebook is there. Although Facebook. I don't know if anybody's on the, the Facebook. Steve, I wanted to talk to you about yes. uh, TikTok's potential fate yeah. in the United States. What do, you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I know there's discussion about um, either banning TikTok or requiring the requiring that it be sold, at least the part that's in the I United so. States, to be sold off to a non-Chinese company. Um, I know there's some controversy over whether over like Donald Trump's stand because he was very anti TikTok, and now he's suddenly pro TikTok uh, because of his relationship with somebody who's an investor in it. So, but if I've when I've read comments, I think there's there's legitimate debate going on. Other people are saying it would be a horrible idea to ban a social media platform, but I don't know where it's all going to go. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a horrible idea if, you know, we are, if the United States is legitimately, you know, being quote unquote spied upon in that app. You know, when you install an app on your phone, you have to, you have to, you know, tell the app not to track you. Mm -hmm. And who's to say that all these apps aren't tracking us? I mean, I don't, I don't trust any of that stuff. I mean, I, I just, 
you know, I, I just suspect that we're leaking incredible amounts of personal data from our devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that angle. Um, and then there's also the other direction where uh, essentially, you know, a government now is in charge of curating information as it goes out over, you know, to a vast majority of the public. Right. So it's one thing for a tech company to be in charge of that which is bad in and of itself, but when like an authoritarian government now is controlling the flow of information, that's like the worst case scenario, right? And it can yeah. be very subtle. You could easily tweak, you know, algorithms in terms of like what to promote and what to, what to lock down and what to prevent based upon subtle things, you know, like only promote news that, you know, that's, uh, Stokes conflict within, you know, political conflict in the United States, for example, you know, yeah. like elevate, you know, contrarian opinions or whatever. Um, that's a, that's a powerful influence to have over a society, you know, and it's, and, and it, it's largely unprovable, you know, like you, yeah. you wouldn't be able to catch them doing it. Um, Unless you can get access to the algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would think that there, there is, well, according to the U S government, it's, it's not, it's considered like an active threat mm -hmm. from their information. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's bad enough if it's all like, if you think about like how, how different articles and videos and whatever are spread on social media, if, if that's all quote unquote organic, right. Meaning it's just based upon user interest and is not being driven from the top down at all mm -hmm. that's bad enough right because that you could say that could favor radicalization and you know extremism uh and sensationalism etc you know if the algorithm is whatever gets the most clicks that has that could have a very negative effect but if you also throw in there and we're going to put our thumb on the scale to push in one political or ideological direction or another that's a that's a n completely different layer right that's to me, that's like the most frightening thing about yeah. that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we don't have the information. That's mm -hmm. what it comes down to. We have we have no idea, you know, what the U.S. government knows. I I would suspect. I mean, I think statistically, it's very likely that they're using it for things that we don't want them to use it for. You know, mm -hmm. but there's no details. That's the problem. You know, we're not going to really. We we probably won't find out anything. Um. You know, TikTok, you know, when I, I go through it and, you know, it's all curated, right? Every, every Anybody that uses TikTok is getting, you know, what their feed is, is, is constantly being manipulated and changed depending on your viewing habits. You know, mm -hmm. if I le watch certain video types more often than others and my feed fills up with that very quickly, it's very responsive yeah. that way. Um. Unfortunately, you know, I think that TikTok is probably, as far as like misinformation goes, it's probably the worst social media platform there is. It's just riddled it, with, with misinformation. Yeah, there's a there's a toxic culture of misinformation on TikTok. I think I agree, just my subjective experience, you know, being involved with this to the degree, to the extent that we are, that it's it, every every social media platform seems to have its own flavor, you know, of, of misinformation. Mm -hmm. but, and TikTok, you know, and we've been talking about this, even when we go over the videos every week, like what, sh what TikTok videos should we respond to every week? We, we, there's, I think, more of a problem on this platform with, I don't know if this person is even if serious, like if they believe what they're saying or not. And I think the culture on TikTok is, is performative, right? It's just performance. It's say whatever you have to say in order to get more attention and clicks. And like whether or not it's real or not is is immaterial, you know. It's like it's all it's like completely obliterates the line between information and entertainment. It's all entertainment, right? Everything. Yeah, and it, ga it it gamifies the content. You know? Yeah, it's it's yeah. You're 100 percent right, Steve. My my perception completely lines up with that. You know, they just making content to get clicks. It has nothing to do with the quality of the content. I mean, there's been bad content like that for a very long time. I mean, it, you know, I, I've, I've seen that type of content go way back, but the density of it on TikTok is profound. You know, it's not just a quality issue. Again, it's this truth 
re reality doesn't matter. It's, it's irrelevant. It's just th this is this is what's entertaining, you know. Um, so like, in terms of like, should I respond to this? Like, I don't want. I don't want to respond to pose, right? To to videos where the person doesn't even believe in what they're saying. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, but the, you also got to take the viewers into consideration. Can't, they of, yeah, I know. They, yeah, they, the audience they, doesn't know. They don't. They don't necessarily distinguish either. Um, I mean, certainly, if my kids were watching it, they wouldn't. They wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. And they come to me every once in a while, and they they picked up some BS from either kids at school or something that they watched and everything. And I'm constantly correcting them, telling them, you know, that's not real. That's you know, that's not how that works. That's not true. You know, mm -hmm. they're just getting bombarded with misinformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Jesus, for $5. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. You. That's awesome. Jesus for you. I would worship Jesus. I love cheese. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone throwing any questions at us in the chat? There? Uh, I just got TikTok up and running. It was, okay. it was not behaving. So is that, is, people are coming. What's the, what are the comments that I'm seeing? Is that all Discord? That's all uh, disc. No, that's uh, YouTube and Twitch. And Facebook is actually there too, although it okay. doesn't seem to show up. But there are some Facebookers. Gotcha. Um, I like baby cheese. And yeah. there is TikTok as well. <laughs> there is TikTok. Could you make the font a little bit bigger if, when yeah, you have time? Zoom in that thing. Yeah. And then we'll get into some videos. That's good. We do have can, a bunch of videos. I can actually read it now. But actually, do you want to do the uh, discussion thing Yeah, first? we could do that. Yeah, we should do that first because I have a parent-teacher conference. Yes. I got to I got to attend today. Twitch comments? No way. Yes, Trust It All. We see you. We see you. <laughs> um, hold on. Let me get... There's a lot of people on, on TikTok that are asking you to go to their Twitch channel. Oh, yeah. That's a very common thing. I wonder why they prefer Twitch. Well, Twitch is a more fun gaming platform, mm -hmm. but it is like discoverability is way better on TikTok than Twitch. Twitch AQ6 is sucks. still alive. Yes. Yes. We are having some scheduling issues. Yeah. Um, real, you know, because it's just things have changed. We are trying to realign our schedule so that we could find a time where the three of us can do some more videos where we have some lined up or ready to go. Um, but we'll we'll sort it out. It'll you know just keep an eye out for that. We'll, there'll be more AQ6 yes, we'll videos coming it. soon. Hello from De from Denmark. We have Denver Denmark. and Denmark. Hello and South Africa. And what South a coincidence! Africa. South Africa. I can't do a accent. South Africa. South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So let us yeah. get into the discussion. Do you know what the discussion is, Jay? Yeah, I have a topic, Steve. Oh. All right. Um, well, we have a. I had a different. We had another topic. Go ahead. Let's go talk ahead. about it. Yeah, we could. We could pick which okay, one we like let's best. Talk about it. Um, Steve, do you want to precursor it? Or well, yeah, I you show want the video. You can show the video. Okay. Yeah, it really yeah. gets to the end of the video that is like the most uh, specific. But uh, let me just pull that one up real quick. Talking yeah, the one I was thinking, Steve. You recently blogged about the mind-body connection, and I thought that that would be. A good topic to cover. That's fun. Um, what do you mean by which, which, which aspect of that? Scientist not not or... brain machine interface. No, no, no. Like you know how people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's there's pseudoscience completely mixed in with that with that concept of the mind body connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll play the video. We'll yeah, see, you'll see we, the topic. Yeah, I think. We'll, maybe we'll do that in a future one. That's a that's a good one. Let's save that for uh, next week. Is this the one? No, that's our email. Don't look at that. <laughs> uh there's this one here we go can you zoom in screen share yeah let me full screen it uh is that taylor swift no, uh yes no it's not taylor swift <laughs> uh hold on where did it go what the uh, hell am i looking it's, at it's, it's it's being weird there we go there's the discussion okay is that chocolate or dirt we were looking dirt. at well, you know a little bit of both play that can everybody see that no they can't hold on stand by it, it it's, it's sending the wrong screen to you guys there we go and usb capture there we go all right now we're cooking let me record on this one there we go nope. tons of 
scientists poured 10 tons of concrete down an ant hole into air vents created by the ants to ventilate their city that was underground. The process of pouring the concrete took 10 days. The scientists dug out 40 tons of earth to reveal the labyrinth, meaning that the ants... So oh, that ended strange. Yeah, that <laughs> last bit is when she just decided to drive off a cliff of logic. Um, so that's what I so wanted to all, talk about. Is all, the... hum all humans are, are incapable of, of what respecting the uh, the sentience of other of other an of animals. So the idea is the the initial question was. Do the ants themselves, are they aware of the overall design of their community, of their city, right? And mm -hmm. the scientific response is no, they're not. They're just following an algorithm in their little ant head, you know, like whatever little cluster of neurons that they have. And the complexity of the city sort of emerges from that simplistic behavior. And she was saying she doesn't like science because she doesn't like that answer because it seems like just humans who are unwilling to acknowledge, you know, the, what she calls the dignity of another species. Uh, when in fact, no, we're just trying to understand the phenomenon in terms of what it actually is. So that was just a bit of an emotional, nonsensical response to a, you know, pretty clear scientific answer. Uh, but the deeper issue is, um, you know, how we think about design in nature and the difference between top-down design and bottom-up design, mm -hmm. right? So that's yeah. that's the discussion that we should have. Okay. We're using that sort of as a jumping-off point. Yeah, gotcha. All right, shall I start? Yeah, you'll start. Hold on, let me stop and start the recording just so we can... Can you move the mic, try moving the microphone a little bit closer to you, Jay, so you're a little bit yeah, less echoey? Little... And just keep your hand yeah, out from behind bring it. Bring it in front of you. It doesn't matter. It's like, you know what I mean? Let me try to put it where the other mic is. Hold on. It'll sort of cut. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect right, placement. <laughs> this is where it needs okay, to be right put here. Put it on the other side, I wonder. Nah, it's no, fine. it's fine. It's fine. Well, let me change your color correction now because I think you fixed it. If I put it side. down here, let me see. Just might get it off camera right here. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely using the mic you see in the shot, everybody. That's the one that he's using. <laughs> Pay no attention to what Jay's doing underneath the desk. <laughs> so, are we responding to an algorithm when we don't know the whole organization of our town? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's like, you know, there are human cities where that are not planned. You ever heard of a planned city? That's kind of the reason why there is such a thing as a planned city is because many cities are unplanned. They evolve over time, over generations, sometimes over, you know, over decades or hundreds of years, where people are just individually adding whatever functionality that they want. And, you know, the overall design of the city emerges from that. But it's actually usually a combination. It's a hybrid because there are... Then, like the city government, you know, there are there is a, organizations who can, uh, like with zoning, et cetera. There is some top-down planning as well, um, but the whole thing wasn't planned or designed from the top down. It kind of just e evolved over time, right? But when you decide, I want to put a store here, you're you know one individual making that decision. You're not aware or in necessarily coordinating that with the overall design of the city, right? In terms of like traffic patterns and, you know, the flow of water and electricity and gas or whatever. Um, that's why cities are often a kludge, you know? They're often, mm -hmm. they often don't make sense or it's, you know, one patch on top of another patch on top of another patch. Um, but the thing about like a city, because it is that unlike say an evolved organism, uh, like a biological organism, a city is you could tear shit down, right? You could, you can massively reorganize the city if you're willing to, you know, to to tear, to tear existing infrastructure down. Like you had the big dig in Boston, right? You know, where they did a massive reorganization of the traffic flow through the city that involved 
you know, you know, redoing a lot of the roads. Um, I'm sorry, I have Jay on the screen because he's been fixing this mic for like five minutes, Jay. Yeah, I'm trying to lock it into. Okay. Okay. Uh, how's this? Is that better? Can you hear me better? I think that's okay. Yeah. Tap on the mic. Make sure it's that mic. Yeah. You got yeah. more juice? No, that's good. It's good. Okay. Just talk at it. All right, I can start, Steve. You ready? Let's yeah. Get back to the business. Um, stand by, stand Do the clacker, by. Steve. Oh, yeah. It's way over there. So far away. Hold on, let me find it. I got it. It's right here. Oh. Just have to... I don't want to take my earbuds off. <laughs> clacker. I barely know. Oh, right in front of Jay's. All right. Uh, I'll do the clacker, then I got to put my earbuds back in. Yes, that's true. Ready? Yep. Good. Thank you so much. You got, Steve, you can't leave it there, man. I have to scooch it over a little, Steve. Let me see if I can do it. Oh, I'll get it. Jay, yeah, Jay, can you get it? Um, this is going. Oh, on. my God. <laughs> is that not good? You have to do it again. Okay. Gotcha. Everything is perfect. Here we go. Uh, all right. We're rolling. Okay. Ready? Should I turn to Steve like this? Talk to <laughs> Ready? Here we go. Steve. Yes, Jay. <laughs> okay. okay. Come Let's on. try it again. Here we go. Steve, there is complexity in the natural world. Mm -hmm. and, and some of that complexity um, is often taken in, in a way where people think that there is some type of mind behind it, some type of like design behind it. Um, and I understand that um, scientists believe that there can be complexity without there having where, where things don't actually have to be incredibly comp complicated because there could be algorithms, there could be repetition in patterns and things like that. This is a complicated topic yeah. that I think a lot of people don't really fully understand or have a good grasp on. So why don't you give us a, a quick one too on you know, this idea of, of the natural world having this complexity that, can, that seemingly comes out of nowhere. Yeah, so it is a very interesting topic. It often comes up in the context of evolution and so-called intelligent design. That's sort of the whole idea of intelligent design, that where there is design, there needs to be a designer. But the unspoken major assumption behind the concept of intelligent design is that all design is top-down, right? Where, but I mean, in, but we know, yeah, you know, from lots of examples that design can be bottom up, meaning it can be, and something that emerges from uh, blind forces, right? So, like evolution is is of course a perfect example. Nobody designed any extant organism, right? No one designed a human being from the from the top down. You know, humans and like all all living organisms evolved, and you know things just there. There again, there was no plan. There was no no uh, uh, foreshadowing of what was going on. It was just one change after another over millions of years. You know, adds up to um, you know the the existing organisms and it is following rules right it's following the rules of evolution it's following the rules of biology uh, the organism has to be functional right it has to function at every stage of of the evolution um, so at the end of the day then you get something that that's very complicated and has um, organs and anatomy and structures that have very sophisticated design but that design just emerged out of the, you know, bottom-up, pro unguided process, right? Let's um, give an example real quick because we we were watching a, a TikTok video where a woman was discussing um, a leaf cutter ant colony, yeah, a gigantic um, like structure that they built underground. They're basically the ants are digging out different, you know, 
pathways and and rooms down there that all all these different things all these different functions mm -hmm. that the rooms have um and then she she believed that you know she was saying that basically you know scientists were dishonoring the uh the ants by destroying their colony you know because they're studying them they have to essentially destroy the colony to to really study the structure of the uh the ants quote unquote city that they built but there are people that would think, how could the ants possibly build something so complicated if they're just ants mm -hmm. that have very small brains? You know, they, they're not sentient. They don't have, you know, self-awareness. Like, where does that complexity come from in, in the, their ability to build that structure underground? Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, the person in that video was saying that, like, scientists are dismissing you know, the dignity of the ants by saying that no single ant understands the complexity and the design of the city. But they're not being disrespectful. They're just being honest. They're being scientists. You know, that, that's, that is our best understanding of how ants build an ant colony. There is no form in ant, right? There's no ant with, like, a blueprint either externally or in their little ant brain of what the overall ant colony looks like. Uh, there are, the ants are just following a, a rather simple algorithm over and over again, and the ant colony emerges, you know, the city emerges from that behavior. It's identical to bees building a, like a honeycomb hive nest, right? The, no single bee understands the overall structure or is con guiding or controlling the overall construction of the beehive. The, the worker bees that are building it are just following some simplistic rule, right? And just if you do it over and over again, then, then repeating patterns will emerge from that. And whatever that rule is, like, you know, you, you lay down um, structure here until this happens and you shift to the right and do it to whatever, you know, just keep doing that. And, and, and we know that from writing computer programs or whatever, that you can create sophisticated patterns out of repetitively following these simple rules. And the rules so, themselves are the ones that evolve, right? You know, the ant behavior changes or bee behavior, whatever colony behavior, you know, evolves over time with these rules being tweaked in order, that, and that affects the this emergent design that comes out of it. That's what I wanted to comment on, Steve. So yeah. if you go back... If you go back millions of years, you know, ants have been around a very, very long time. But you go back to, you know, when this process was first starting, it was, pr first of all, it was probably starting before ants were ants, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, whatever creatures they were before they became ants, they were probably developing this colony behavior. Um, and it gets imprinted, right? It gets imprinted in the way that their brains form. Just like human beings, we have instinct, instincts that are not taught, that are that are a part of our the wiring in our brain that are that are passed from human to human. Mm -hmm. It just happens. It's part it's part of our evolution. So ants have the same thing. So you're saying that their behaviors have been be, just like in any other living organism. They're the the uh, the stresses on them to survive. We're tweaking the behaviors of the ants over time, meaning the ones that did this were more successful and they passed on their genes to the next generation and then that generation um, and so on and so on until they got yeah. an algorithm that worked where they could have like a very, you know, robust colony that they can build underground without having to have three pounds of brain matter sitting on top of, you know, mm -hmm. you know, in their head, right? Yeah, this happens in many different you know, contexts and layers. So for example, we could think of developmental biology the same way. Um, the, the information in, the, in your brain, right, or even in the brain of a newborn infant, vastly outnumbers the information stored in our genes. So how is that possible? How is it that the genes, are, right, our DNA, um, can construct a, a structure, the, you know, the human brain, you know, the whole human body, that has more information in it than is stored in the DNA itself, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's because the DNA is not a blueprint 
for the organism, right? A human DNA is not a blueprint of a human. It's, a, it's an algorithm. It's a list of instructions that if you follow, a human develops out of that, emerges out of that. So it's the same thing, just developmental rather than sort of a colony behavior. So like, for example, it's like, yeah, just keep making neurons here and then um, until this happens, right, until you bump up against this re, you know, constraint or... Um, you know, when a lot of a lot of the, um, the brain development is what we call somatotopic mapping, where like the the feedback into the brain determines how it develops, which is also part of how you get more information in there. So th this kind of emergent design comes from you know the colony behavior of certain insects. It comes from developmental biology. It comes from evolution, and it even comes from human behavior. A lot of people say, well, aren't humans just sophisticated ant colonies? And from a lot of perspectives, the answer is yes. So you could look at the economy, for example. There's a lot of patterns of behavior in the economy that no individual consumer necessarily is doing deliberately or planning or controlling. It's just when you have, you know, the behavior, the economic behavior of three million people causes you know, emergent design, emergent patterns to come out of that, where people may just be following a very simple algorithm, like I'm going to buy the cheapest version of this thing that I could find, right? That's mm -hmm. like a very pretty, people probably have fairly simple buying economic behavioral algorithms that we follow, right? You know, some combination of good reviews, it looks good to me, and cheap price or whatever, like there's probably a few factors that people consider and then they make the purchasing decisions based upon that. And, uh, and you know, uh, out of all of that behavior comes a really complicated economy. Now, be, that, that's not a perfect example because with a lot of human behavior, there's a combination of bottom-up and top-down design going on, right? We have the Fed, for example, who could literally consciously change the interest rates in order to, you know, steer the economy in one direction or another. So there is this sort of chaos, emergent behavior out of billions of individual economic decisions, and then you have, you know, larger and larger institutions making individual top-down decisions which affect, affect it all. Same thing with city planning, right? Most cities are not planned cities. They are, nobody drew out the entire city and then built it from scratch, right? Cities evolve over time. They start as smaller, you know, as towns and then bigger towns and then small cities and then bigger cities, et cetera, where functionality and infrastructure is added over time. And there's some planning that goes on, but there's a lot of things that happen that were not necessarily planned. Maybe what was planned was something that was immediate, like, oh, we need to add a road because we need more traffic here. And, you know, that sort of individual decisions pile up over decades and centuries until you have a, a very large city that nobody would have designed up front, right? Like, no one would have started off and said, this is how we're going to lay things out. It just happened, again, spontaneously. So there's, there's bottom-up design everywhere, in nature, in any kind of complicated system, in any kind of, you know, uh, society, colony or organism, anything like that, anytime where there's, you know, repetitive behaviors that, where patterns can emerge from that, you're going to have some bottom-up design. Again, I do think that the most stunning example of that is evolution. You could get something as complicated as a human being with nothing designing it from the top down. It's just a hundred percent emergent, you know, structure and function and design just from millions of years of, and even billions of years, if you go back to, you know, our single celled organisms of just, you know, individual survival of the fittest kind of decisions. Um, and it's powerful. It could be extremely, extremely powerful. Steve, give me an example of top down. So top down is like, it's a, a, a work of art, right? Where you have an artist who imagines something entirely in their head and then creates it with where every element of it is controlled down to the last mm -hmm. detail. And the whole thing was designed, you know, from, from the beginning, right? So that's top down or something which is engineered, right? If you have a, you know, a group of engineers designing a new car, they might from the top down design every single aspect of it. Um, 
although technology itself can goes both ways, right? There's a lot of top-down design going on, but often there's a lot of bottom-up design happening too. Whenever old decisions get locked into the future, you are going to have some kind of emergent design, right? Um, so I know Stephen Jay Gould liked to give the example of the modern typewriter, uh, the the where the letters are laid out, not necessarily the most optimal design from the top down, uh, but you know decisions that were made early on in the history of the technology of the typewriter sort of got locked in. Or another sort of favorite example is that the the distance between railroad ties, you know, is is the same as the distant, you know, the width of two horses behind, because you can go all the way back to you know this the the size of the ruts and carriages, based, you know, that had two horses in front of them, and how that kind of thing got locked into technology going forward. So there's a lot of contingent, historically contingent elements to technology, but technology you can always tear things down and redesign them and redo them, right? So there is some top-down design happening at the same time. So basically, whenever people are involved, there's usually a lot of of a combination of sort of a hybrid of top down and bottom up design. Um, but in nature, we're dealing all with bottom up design, right? Things that are spontaneously emergent behavior, emergent structure, coming from lots of individual behaviors. So, are do do humans do bottom up design? Like, do we engage in that, or do we we do we more do top down? So again, we do both. It kind of depends on the context. Um, you know, I gave a lot of examples of things where there's a lot of bottom-up elements to it because uh, because it's happening over a long period of time, because people are making short-term decisions that have long-term consequences. Uh, but 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 we can always you know impose top-down design on things where we have the ability to like tear things down and start over. You know, you can certainly un you could erase the historical parts of it and then. You know, you could shift the balance towards top-down design. So, is there is there bottom-up happening, like even in intellectual pursuits? So, I, I do. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you know, if, for example, um, when we like, if you if you are uh, crocheting or knitting, for example, that's a good example of something that we do where, like, you you people develop these patterns, these techniques. Like, you do this over and over again for you know a few thousand times and you get this pattern that emerges from it. So that's kind of, it's an interesting combination because we kind of create the algorithm to guide the repetitive behavior. And then even if you don't know what the design's going to be, that design will emerge out of that repetitive behavior. That's kind of a good human analogy to like how the ants build their colonies or how bees build their, their honeycombs. Just follow this pat, this behavior and the pattern emerges uh, right, but and, and bottom up, bottom up behavior in the animal world doesn't mean that they're sentient. No, no, that doesn't require sentience. Um, but it does, it just requ it does require behavior, though, right? Yeah. Um, and when 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 it's emerging from animal behavior, uh, but then there are contexts in which you know design can happen without there being any even organism involved. So a snowflake, for example, right. No one's designing the snowflakes, but snowflakes can have really beautiful designs. You know, they could be very, very pretty. But that's just where there's a there is more of a chemical process that is ha that is happening, where there's a, some kind of repetitive, you know, chemical process that has its own built-in physical laws in terms of like the angle of the molecules resulting in crystals with certain you know, geometric structures, and how they unfold, and then you get a beautiful snowflake. You know, that's a perfect example of a chemically driven like physical process of bottom up uh, design that can result in something very intricate and beautiful. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and e even in like in orga organisms like um, seashells where you have like a beautiful spiral pattern, obviously nothing is designing that or, or, or creating that from the top down. But what you have is an evolved developmental algorithm where the, design emerges from the algorithm, which itself emerged from an evolutionary bottom-up process. So it was like two layers of bottom-up design happening at the same time. One evolutionary, one developmental, resulting in something as intricate, sometimes very symmetrical, very geometric, 
like a pine cone or a nautilus shell or something like that. So there's tons of this multi-layered bottom-up design that we see in nature. Yeah, a lot of people give credit to to their God, you know, for structures. Yeah, I mean, like if, you, if you assume all design is top down, then you have to. Well, there's got to be something intelligence out there designing all this stuff. Uh, but the, but it, that's the key, I think, realization in all of this is that design does not have to be top down. It could be an emergent phenomenon from simple rules uh, that that uh, that are not conscious, that are chemical, developmental, evolutionarily physical, whatever these rules can be, you know, in a computer program or whatever. And people, any, like, a lot of us, you know, grew up writing some basic code, and, and I did this myself, you know, where you play around with code, where you say, just do this over and over again, and let's see what happens. And then, you know, you know, beautiful patterns or sometimes, like, I was trying to simulate the structure of galaxies, for example, in a computer program, in a, just a very simple algorithm, and you just keep tweaking it until you get something that looks like a spiral galaxy, you know, with a lot of structure to it, but really, it's, a, I literally wrote the code, it's just a simple algorithm that's being, like, do this 10,000 times, and then this is what emerges out of it, so that's the same thing that, that evolution did, although, and there was not a person doing that, that was just evolutionary forces, you know, natural selection doing that. Steve, I have one last question. Yeah. Do you think that meatballs came from bottom up or top down? So I think the cultural things are like that. I know this is a, you're only semi-serious with the question, but if you broaden that to a, real, a serious question, something cultural, like bread, where did bread come from? Or where did meatballs come from? Or whatever. So there are individual people who are making very deliberate top-down design decisions, but over cultural time, it evolves, right? And no one person developed uh, that technology or that cultural practice. Or like, you think about modern music. Did somebody design rock and roll? No, there was no architect that where rock and roll music as a genre was developed out of whole cloth by one individual making all the decisions that went into what it is. That is something that culturally developed over time, culturally evolved over time, where there were lots of people each contributing their piece to the puzzle. And again, that may have been a conscious contribution, but collectively it was an emergent bottom-up kind of process. So anything like food recipes or you know, lots of different technologies, art, you know, music, those kind of things are all very bottom up kind of processes. Well, I mean, I, I was kind of joking, but like you answered my question yeah. even better than I thought you possibly could. All right. So meatballs are basically bottom up. Well, a lot of it. Yeah. Like, okay. like anything I, cultural, there's going to be, it's a combination, but there's a huge, you know, over time, there's a huge bottom up component to it. All right. Thanks, Steve. This is really you really like explained it well, and I, I feel like I can go on to cooking meatballs better now. <laughs> you know, right, meatballs are from God. Meatballs They're from, from God. God. They're from Jesus balls. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, what did I just meatballs. say? Jesus, ball. Jesus balls is not allowed on TikTok, okay? No, sorry. We're Thanks banned. a lot. <laughs> the science of... So you're just doing yep. a spirograph. Yeah, you're just doing a repetitive motion, and the algorithm is in the gears... And then you get a beautiful sort of symmetrical design out of it. You didn't necessarily know what was going to emerge from it, and you didn't design that from the top down. It's just a, it, a spirograph is an algorithm for generating, you know, uh, uh, symmetrical, repetitive designs. Right? It's the same thing. It's a it's a bottom up art generator in a way. That's really cool. That's a good example. It's also interesting to think about like uh, AI. Right, because mm -hmm. when you make a piece of art with, you know, a picture with, say, Mid Journey, is that top down or bottom up? Wow, it's bottom up, right? Yeah, yeah it's got to be. It's, but it, it's, yeah, like they. That's the thing. You see all those designs right here. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, really yeah. cool. Yeah, it was a fun. It was really fun. We're not sponsored by Timu or Taymu. No, we're not. Yeah. I mean, you could also make a design like that by like putting. Oh, have you seen the paint, guys? Sorry, I just cut you off. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to oh, say. Yeah, like, I you could put a pen or a paint, some paint, and you spin it. It's on a rope, like a paint yeah. can is on a rope. It has a tiny hole in it, so the paint's coming out as a tiny little stream, and then it makes these crazy designs. Yeah, so are... artists will leverage bottom-up design a lot. They come up with a technique. 
the technique you know, it allows them to create some design elements that they incorporate into their artwork where they didn't necessarily make every tiny little aspect of it. Like if your technique is taking a brush and flipping the paint off of it. Yeah, off of it. yeah there you go. Um, How cool is that? Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. That's a sick That guy one. just, that's probably worth a thousand bucks right there. I don't know. <laughs> well, you have to have a whole room to do that. Look at this. It's like, I mean, clearly it's his garage, probably. But why did he paint over it? Because do another one, I guess. I don't know. Because it does make a little layered thing. You see it kind of underneath the white. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. There's a couple people on here that do this. Like, that's all they do on TikTok, which is awesome. That's, I mean, good for them. But uh, they do all kinds of fun designs. Anyway, yeah, yeah. That's All right, like, so again, like when I was in high school and playing around with computers, you know, for the first time, and you realize, like, when you, when when you've learned like the few codes you need to learn to get stuff to appear on the screen, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And then you just play around with mathematical algorithms. And it generates all of like it's basically a digital spirograph, right? Like it's very yep. it's very fun to play with, but it's the same thing. You're just c coming up with a few lines of code that just does it over and over again, and pretty stuff emerges from that. All right, Steve, you're going to go on to do some TikTok videos. Yes, I have videos. Three, three TikTok videos. I'm going to do. Yeah, three. And TikToks. you're going to go talk to teachers about your kids. <laughs> That's right. So, real, tell me before I go, what did what was the Joe Rogan video? What did he do? Uh, do you want oh, us to boy. play it for? We could do yeah, let's see. Let me see it, and then I'll. Well, which one did you? Should we play the nine eleven one? The fake one, though. No, for, the real nine eleven one. I know, but I was going to say, should we play that one for Jay? But the it, fake. We can play the fake one for Jay. We'll play the. Well, let's see, Jay. Is it fake? Is it fake? Well, you you choose a random one, do the fake one, and true. then we'll see what if Jay knows. What okay, it is. yeah, we'll see which one Jay thinks is the okay is the fake and which one's real. Which one's science? Which one's fiction? Quick game of that. With chat as well. This is the game we're going to be playing for the rest of our lives. For the rest of <laughs> our lives. Uh, unmute it. NASA knows where Leviathan is and doesn't want you to know. NASA was once a marine exploration organization from the late <laughs> 50s to the early 70s. How could you Much tell? Much of what NASA did during these years <laughs> remains classified and unknown. However, some fascinating files were recently disclosed by a former NASA employee, Michael Thomas, who leaked many classified NASA files. Look at most that. Look at that. called oh Operation Leviathan. So this was a special mission conducted between 1967 in 1969. And what the operation involves is terrifying. In that was from Subnautica. That, NASA launched yeah. a new mission <laughs> that was from the aim of actually finding the Leviathans. Despite the absurdity of their endeavor, only 5.5% of the oceans had been explored by 2024. And in the 60s, only 3% had been explored. So the possibility of finding a giant creature Wow, you hear the plosive they added? On March 1st, 1967, they launched a cool. specialized yeah. fleet cool. of 11 research ships equipped with sonar technology, which was new at the time. Then, for over a year, these ships scoured the ocean looking for signs of Leviathan. And on... All right, we get enough. So this, I mean, the first thing I noticed was that his, his lips weren't sinking to the yeah, sound. Yeah, they were not the first video, yeah. That's, that's going to be... We won't have that luxury a year from now. That's yeah. going to be something that they fix. But Joe Rogan doesn't talk Thank this way. You. I was going to say he's too articulate, but that's kind of mean. I don't want to be too mean to him. But he's like, it's like he was reading like a well-performed yeah. script, right? Like, yeah. I'm sure Joe could do that. He yeah. could read that well. He's an but actor, he, you know. But he doesn't, yeah, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that on the show. So let's see right, which so one this? is more far-fetched, I guess. Um, you know, let me do it as the TikTok while we're sitting here. I'll just record it. Oh, that's the ending. That's not what I meant to do. Uh, oh, let me just switch cameras real quick. Because I got... Going to TikTok mode. Do I need to move over to the left? So the one I'm going to do, Jay, where he's, he's, he basically, Rogan, is saying the day before 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld in a press conference said that the Pentagon lost $2.3 trillion. The it implication being that 9-11 was basically just a huge distraction from that revelation. Yeah. Oh, my God. 
All right, let me see. I know it's stupid on so many levels. Because I'm remote, it's like still doesn't it being a little weird. Let me try to record it from TikTok. See if that doesn't. All right, I'm gonna go, guys. Right. I will see you both. Um, I'll see you tonight, Steve. Oh, okay. And Ian, I'll call you tomorrow, brother. All right. Talk. See you. Bye. Everyone, say bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you soon. Say, Ted says bye too. He says lay sigh. <laughs> Lay side. <laughs> Lay side. See you later, Ted. Be good, guys. All right. Bye bye, Jay. All right. Let me close out. Jay, I was eating up some resources. I couldn't record. Uh, okay. We'll start recording here. All right. And I'll just play a little bit of that. Got me in the TikTok frame. TikTok frame. We got you. Oh, you know what? Let me uh, record this one here and also TikTokify you. Actually, I guess I gotta do it like that. That's fine. You wanna hear another conspiracy theory that, that you probably don't know is gonna blow your mind? Let's do it. The day before 9 11, the day before the attacks, Rumsfeld gave a press conference where he talked about trillions of dollars missing. Then a plane slams into the very part of the building where they were doing the accounting, blows up half the fucking building of the Pentagon blows up a wall. Donald Rumsfeld was on, where was it, the White House lawn? Listen to this. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. <laughs> $2.3 <laughs> Okay, now, again, somebody told you that literally, like, right before 9-11 happened, they said they, they couldn't track $2.3 trillion. You'd go... No, that didn't happen. That did not happen, but it did happen. What the fuck? Uh, that other, the comedian, I think it's Tony Hinchcliffe. Chat, remind me if that's Tony Hinchcliffe. I think he's from Kill Tony. Yeah, Hinchcliffe. Hinchcliffe? Not yet. Not that you necessarily need to reference him, but just in case. And, um, oops. There we go. Oh, wait. We want the TikTok background. Oh, yeah. There we go. All right, we're rolling. This is a typical kind of conspiracy theory. It's really easy to make something sound sinister just by throwing out, like, the implication, the question. You know, the day before 9-11, Rumsfeld made this, you know, amazing, I guess, confession in a press conference. But you have to think a little bit more deeply, like, for what is the actual story here. What does Rogan think actually happened? Does he think that Rumsfeld was not supposed to reveal this information or that he revealed the information and then the government within a day orchestrated the 9-11 thing to happen and to cover it up? I mean, that makes no sense. Or were they planning on doing those two things at the same time? Again, why? It doesn't make any sense. The conspiracy theory is completely nonsensical. It also is demonstrably wrong. Like, he doesn't even have his facts straight. So, first of all, the what Rumsfeld was talking about was a report that had come out a year earlier. So, this information was out there in the public domain for a year. During that press conference, you have to listen to the whole thing that Rumsfeld said. This is available online. Just go check it out. He was not. He did not say, and he was not saying that the Pentagon lost two point three trillion dollars. Like we didn't know where it was or what happened to it. That's not what he was saying at all. What he was saying was that the Pentagon has outdated computers and equipment and systems in place for tracking the money that the Pentagon spends. Right? He was making making a comparison to private industry, where like in the private sector companies have updated computer systems that can track their accounting very, very accurately. But the Pentagon is outdated. It has older systems. The different systems don't talk to each other necessarily. Different departments that can't necessarily compare their accounting. And so it was estimated in this report from an er a year earlier that $2.3 trillion of the money that the Pentagon spends cannot be tracked in detail. Like we cannot account for exactly 
everything, you know, the, everything that happens with it. Not that it's lost or that it wasn't spent appropriately. It's just that the tracking systems are outdated. That was the point. And that's why there was no big, you know, huge reaction in the media because it wasn't, he wasn't saying we lost $2.3 trillion. He was just complaining about outdated technology at the Pentagon. And again, this information was in the public domain for a year, not just like the day before 9-11. That was just when Rumsfeld was referencing it. So this is easily you know, trackable. You could easily find what the full story is. You could read the full transcript of, or listen to like the full press release you know, the conference that Rumsfeld has, it's pretty clear what he was talking about. Um, but this is, but conspiracy mongers could take that out of context, take the coincidence, you know, that it was the day before 9-11 and try to make it seem like something super sinister was going on without ever having to connect the dots, right? Without having to create a coherent story that makes sense. Like, what do they think actually happened? You know, it, it, again, we, the, when you think even slightly below this paper-thin superficial conspiracy theory, the whole thing collapses because it makes absolutely no sense. There is no way you could make a, a sensible narrative out of those sequence of events. It's just complete and, and utter nonsense. So, But this one is doubly nonsense because it makes no logical sense and it's factually demonstrably incorrect. Right, that one's because Rogan is an ass. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> an ass with a hat on. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean it's funny how the AI did has not managed to match his cadence. Yeah, it's so yeah, very yeah. specific, but it's also like, you know, so broy, whatever, <coughs> dumbed down. The AI has got to get a lot smarter to get that. I don't know, I've seen, <laughs> you know, the AI, you know, voice simulators do a better job than that already. I think. Yeah. I don't know who did that. Maybe they didn't know what That's they were true. doing or they were using older versions of software. It'll get there, software. probably. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys seen the nuclear weapon denier Rogan had on recently? That oh. no nuclear weapons exist? The nuclear weapon denier? What, that they don't exist? Or like, like I guess it's probably like we didn't actually drop them on Japan is probably his overarching yeah. theory. And it's, I don't know, it's so dumb. Uh, again, it's hard to make sense of. Yeah, it's like, okay, bro. Yeah. Um, all right. Next one up is let's see we have the which one do you want to do actually um the parasite thing yeah the parasite one cleanse yes yeah. this one there we go did you see the Oops. article today in people worm eggs found Go back so everybody can enjoy this one. Enjoy this one with us. All right, here we go. Did you see the article today in People? Worm eggs found in man's brain after he complained of migraines and undercooked bacon is to blame. You have to purify parasite cleanse three to four times a year. Rolling. Yeah, so parasite cleansing is a, apparently a TikTok trend uh, these days. It's also complete nonsense and potentially dangerous. So no, you don't have to parasite cleanse three to four times a year. Uh, so what are parasites? These are organisms that can cause in infections that... Uh, where they they don't uh, like have a, a virulent or acute or active infection. They just live part of their life cycle in another organism. And like, for example, if you have like worm parasites in your GI system, uh, they will suck away your nutrients and that can cause you know bloating and gas and abdominal pain, fatigue and, and unexplained weight loss. Of course, those symptoms are fairly nonspecific, and a lot of things can cause, you know, bloating and abdominal pain without having parasites. Um, the thing is, in Western, industrialized, and developed, wealthy nations, parasitic infections are really rare. They're not something you have to worry about. You get parasites 
from doing things like drinking untreated water or eating raw or uncooked meat that hasn't gone through an inspection process. Uh, so that's, again, but usually if somebody comes down with parasites, like I'm a physician, if a patient has a parasitic infection, like the first question is, where have you been traveling? You know, like where, what part of the world were you in recently? And that's where we usually learn where the parasite came from. Uh, either that or they, they had to have been engaging in some sort of risky behavior that most people don't engage in. Like, for example, if you hunt and eat the food that you hunt and you don't know how to properly inspect the animals that you kill to make sure that they're not infected with parasites and you don't properly prepare the food or handle it properly or you undercook it, then yes, that could put you at risk for parasites. Or if you're in the habit of camping and drinking unboiled or untreated stream water, yeah, there are parasites in there that you can get. But usually there's either some foreign travel or really risky behavior that people engage in. If you're just living your normal life, you know, eating food, drinking treated water, your risk of a parasite infection is extremely low. Medicine is all a game of risk versus benefit. Therefore, like the benefit of a parasite cleanse, like as a routine measure, when your risk of ever getting a parasite is so low, is just not there, right? The benefit is not there. What are the parasite cleanses themselves? Now, sometimes they're benign. There are things like, you know, just eat less salt or, you know, reduce your dairy intake or your fat intake or whatever. So it's some kind of dietary restriction that may in and of itself be fairly benign. Of course, if you're, you know, losing weight because you have an actual parasite infection, that's probably not a good idea to exacerbate your weight loss. But most people, when they're talking about parasite cleanses, they're talking about some kind of herbal concoction, right? Um, a lot of these contain wormwood. Now, wormwood does have some anti-helminthic, you know, which is a type of parasite activity, maybe some anti-malarial activity. So there are some anti-parasite activity in that. But um, if you actually had a parasitic infection, taking an herbal wormwood is, is probably not a good idea. Um, so first of all, with you know, like herbal, there's over 500 species of wormwood. So how do you know what you're getting? What part of the of the plant that you're getting? How what you, concentration it it is? How it was prepared? You know what season it was harvested? There's all kinds of variables that would affect the concentration of different constituents, and also um, the while while wormwood you know components have been shown to have activity in vitro, meaning like in a petri dish. There have been several studies where they look at it in animals, for example, because animals, you know, do are at higher risk of of parasitic infections because they do often you know graze in the wild, for example. Uh, that that has not really shown a good effect because just because something has an effect in a petri dish doesn't mean it's going to work when you eat it or in an organism because there's lots of other variables involved like bioavailability, how much of it gets absorbed, how much of it goes to the place where it needs to be in your body to have an effect. How quickly is it eliminated from the body? Does it hang out long enough to have an effect? And of course, if you don't know those things, you won't know how to dose it. And if you're not measuring and purifying the active ingredients, you won't know how much you're getting. So bottom line is if you actually have a parasitic infection, you should be seeking medical attention and you should be getting proven therapies, actual medicines that will work to treat the parasite. That is a serious illness that does need to be treated. And, but if you don't have a parasitic infection and you don't you know, engage in super risky behavior, uh, there's no benefit to a parasite cleanse. It probably doesn't work. A lot of them include um, other things in there that will cause diarrhea because that makes people think that it's working. But again, there's no benefit to that. And if you actually had a parasitic infection, that would be counterproductive. You don't want to exacerbate one of the symptoms of a parasite infection. So it's all risk and no benefit. Wormwood, by the way, can cause liver toxicity, right? Because it is a drug. It can cause um, liver damage, liver toxicity. So if you don't know how much you're getting, or if you're just, you know, dramatically increase the dose just to make sure you get enough in there, you don't know that it's safe, right? You could be causing liver damage. So, you know, use actual medicine, you know, see a doctor, get prescribed actual medicine if you think you may have an actual parasite infection, but routine parasite cleanses are worthless and may be dangerous and they're not worth your time or money.
cool. Let me stop this one. Then we're going to do the uh, Pentagon UFO one. Yeah. Somebody had an interesting statement on AI. Did you see this one? No. Let's see. What is this? Has Pop AI actually solved any real problems? All I'm seeing is AI that can do things that humans can already do, art, copywriting, chatting, etc. People celebrate these sort of developments. However, they aren't really adding anything new to society. In fact, all I'm seeing is a replacement of humans with cheap knockoffs. What am I missing? So yeah, I mean, if you if you're limiting that to what you are calling pop AI, it's kind of like you're it's kind of almost like a circular statement there. Like you're saying the AI that doesn't do anything doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah, but what about all of the those algorithms are also being used to make scientific research much faster, for example. So there that AI is transforming our science and technological development. It is really happening and that is having a profound effect on society. There are also those same algorithms, those same AI can be used in, for professionals in ways that are also potentially helpful. I think we've, we're just scratching the surface of that. For example, using AI as an assistant in medical diagnosis, for example, can be very, very powerful. Using it to any time when you have to analyze a lot of complicated data, it could be very powerful. But sure, the toys, like you know, the art generation programs, I personally know artists who are using it as part of their process, so it can be used by professionals. What is that? Yeah, it's, me. it's TikTok. Sorry. Okay. TikTok is so dumb sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it also can be used as just a toy to play with. I use Midjourney and ChatGPT all the time. I use it sometimes to just make searches more, you know, easier because it's natural language. I use it for creating artwork for my own personal use. Um, so it ha it's, you know, the uses are all the way up and down the spectrum from, you know, playing with it to helping, you know, real, you know, professionals do their job to like transforming you know, data analysis and management actually accelerating scientific and technological research, right? Like if you're using it in, for for drug discovery, you could do three months of research in a in a weekend. That's a profound benefit to society. You know, if I'm using it to make funny pictures for my personal use, that's not helping society, but it's fun. It, you know, I, I enjoy it. Um, so yeah, it kind of depends on on what application you're looking at. All right, cool. Um, should we move on to the next one? Or we could take some chat questions if you have any chat. Oh, I'm trying to fix something. I tried Mid Journey for background design and animation. Couldn't get it to be specific enough. Yeah, I, I have that problem too. So it depends on it depends on what you're trying to get Mid Journey to do. If you need something very very specific, it can take a lot of work and a lot of chance, you know, to get it to do to match your vision. If you have a more general idea where you don't the deed the tiny details aren't that important, but the overall design is what you need, then it works great for that sort of thing. But there are program. If you need the details, so you could either like get as close as you can with something like Midjourney or Dolly, and then then port it into Photoshop, and then you have total control over the details. But there's also now, which I haven't had a chance to play with yet, but people have told me about. There are AI programs that allow you to take a picture and then zero in on one part of that picture to make a change. Right, so you can mess around with the details of the picture by zeroing in. It's like a backfill kind of a program. So, and it's only going to get better from there. I mean, but this is already. Then it's been a pretty steep curve in the last couple of years with these uh, with this software. Um, but right now, yeah, if you're trying to use it to make something that you need that's very specific, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of work. You have to really learn how to phrase your prompt really well. Um, but here's the other thing is that there's online communities that share their work and their prompts and you could build off of them really mm -hmm. well. So if you like on Discord, for example, you could do this with Midjourney where if you, uh, you can go into specific Discord channels where, the, where people are messing around with Midjourney and you, they, you could see their prompt, you could see the result, and you could learn a lot from that, from what, from what the community is doing. And you can also just take their prompt yeah. It's all public domain, and then use it as a starting point, and then make changes from there. 
Yeah. Um, so you're not you're not just on your own. But yeah, if you're just noodling around on your own, it could be really challenging. Palador, I think I've seen you comment this before. <laughs> the the beardless female dwarfs, even though canonically, I think uh, female dwarfs do have beards, right? That yeah, but that's the but the, the point. I think the bigger point is is that it, you know the, it only knows what's on the internet, right? Yeah. And so it, it is interesting. You sometimes you might have to use a different word. Like, yeah. so I realized that too. Like, oh, when I use certain words, it triggers certain connections in the yeah. software in the AI that I don't want, you know. And so you have to figure out a way to to get what you want with a different word. Like, you can't. You learn that specific words trigger specific responses because that's what's out there, you know. That's that's what that word is associated with. A bunch of people emailed us that there is a way to do spot specific yeah. alterations. Yeah, the backfilling kind of thing. Yeah, where you so could the, zero in on a spot and then make that change. Might be able to do that. Yeah, and then I've been playing around. So ChatGPT4, if you pay for it, you can use that to then, it will generate the prompt for Dolly 2, I think it is, or Dolly 3. So you could tell ChatGPT, make me a picture of this in natural language, without having, and it will make the prompt. Then, in, and it's also iterative because it remembers your last thing. So you can say, yeah, that's good, but now make it without a beard. You know, so you could try that as well. And I, I've done that, and I've had some good results from that, but it's still tricky. It's not like it's a no-brainer. Again, because it, it, the AI doesn't understand anything, Yeah. right? It's just you're still trying to get it to use the right words to provoke the right response. Um, but it doesn't understand engineering. It doesn't understand physics. It doesn't understand what things actually are, you know, so it, it is... It is limited in that way. It's again, it's like really powerful in some ways, really brittle in other ways, and you have to learn how to sort of learn the difference and learn how to leverage it. It's not a no-brainer at this point. It's not general AI. It's not a an AI assistant where you could just tell it, "I this is what I want," and then have it do it. You know, yeah. you really have to learn how to how to utilize the tool. All right, let's move on to. Which one is the next one? Let me go back. Du, 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 du. The almond milk one? Is that the one you No, know? no, the, uh, the the Pentagon UFO one. Oh, right. Oh, the report. Yeah, the report. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that video that you sent to me, they did a pretty good job of yeah. reviewing it, but there's a lot more to say. You guys so are not going to like... Yeah, that's, it's pretty good. So let's let's go into this one. Boop, boop, boop. Um... Why is that one not auto switch? Should auto switch. Boop. Zoom. All right. Let me echo. Let me stop and start. Yeah, just get a little clip from her and then. Yeah. Okay. I'll go from there. Just do the beginning, maybe. Recording. You guys are not going to like this. A giant Pentagon report was just released that detailed the U.S. government's involvement with UAPs. This did include the results of witness reports to Congress. The class of... That's probably good, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So then this... All right, we're wrong. So, yeah, I understand. I get it. The government is saying the government is not hiding information. And if you're a conspiracy theorist, that's not going to be very compelling. But let's delve a little bit deeper into what the report found. So first of all, the idea is that there are, you know, the idea of UFO government conspiracy is that parts of the government are hiding their knowledge of UFOs from other parts of the government, like from Congress, for example. So Congress basically mandated that the D Department of Defense, the Pentagon, do this report, and they had the power to investigate at all levels of classification, right, according to their, their own report. They were able to review um, any classified document at all levels of classification to see if there was any interaction between the U.S. government and alien phenomenon, and they couldn't find anything. Right. So, of course, if you're going to try to maintain that there's a conspiracy going on, you have to then think that there are levels of classification that people don't even know exist. Right. That there are things that are secret that even a, a, a you know, completely uh, uh, the Pentagon report at the highest level of classification would not even know it, which how would you know that it exists? Right. 
if you can hide that this from the Department of Defense and the Pentagon, how do, how does anybody in the public know that it exists? But the real details are important here because they talk about the the UFO researchers who have been producing a lot of the testimony to Congress and also a lot of the recent interest in UFOs. And what they found was a couple of things, which is consistent with skeptical UFO researchers and what we found, again, looking at these people and their claims, et cetera. One type of report that they found very common was what they call circular hearsay, right? Where one UFO investigator is reporting what another one said who's reporting what another one said, who's reporting what the first one said to begin with. So it's just this circle of reporting about UFOs, about eyewitness accounts or evidence or theories or whatever. They're just reporting on what each other is saying. The other thing that they found is that a lot of the eyewitnesses, first of all, these are not people who have first-person accounts, right? These are not people who are in the secret program, who have first-hand knowledge. It was always a friend-of-a-friend kind of a report. And when you go to the next layer, that person says, no, it was this other guy. And then you just keep going back, and it leads nowhere. You never dig down to bedrock, right, where you have a first-hand account of actual alien phenomenon. But what they found was that these secondhand accounts by people who were either not in the government or just peripherally you know, involved but are not, were not in, obviously, the secret program, that they were often referring to real, legitimate, either military or intelligence operations, but they completely misinterpreted what they heard, right? They were motivated to interpret what they heard in the context of their preferred narrative, their idea that there are aliens, you know, visiting the earth and the government knows about it. So, but they were all just, again, conspiracy mongering. They were just misinterpreting statements that were referring to known legitimate military or intelligence programs or activities or whatever. Uh, and of course the Pentagon was able to say, no, that that's, I, they, they were able to find, like, no, this is what this guy was referring to. It's this program over here that we know about. You know, we have the, now the clearance to, to know, you know, what is going on. This, is, this has nothing to do with alien technology or aliens or anything. And this is true not only of the government and the Department of Defense. It's also true of any private company or industry, right? They found no evidence that there's any private company in, who is in possession of alien technology. They found no evidence that there's any activity going on within the government that deals with alien, alien contact, alien biological material, or alien technology. And the other part of their report had to do with the eyewitness accounts themselves, like people who say that they saw a UAP, right, which is the new term for a UFO, UAP being unidentified anomalous phenomena. And they found what all science-based UFO researchers have found over the last 50 years, which is that whenever you investigate in detail any individual report, you find that it was a misidentified terrestrial mundane phenomenon, right? It was a bird, an insect, an airplane, some kind of you know, natural phenomenon, etc. that you, you never find any evidence that there was something truly extraterrestrial going on or unexplainable going on. What you end up with is 95 to 98 percent of the time, you can positively identify the phenomenon as being a misidentified craft or natural phenomenon. And then two to five percent of the time, you can't positively identify it, not because it's something strange, but because the quality of the evidence is too low. There is insufficient evidence or the evidence is too low quality to make any kind of positive identification. That's it. So that's consistent with a phenomenon that's purely psychological and cultural, right? The psychocultural hypothesis of UFOs, that this is just a belief system that has taken on a life of its own and it's mainly just being perpetuated by cultural belief, but it's not a real, physical, tangible phenomenon happening out there in the real world. Whenever you investigate something like this, you always, you know, you can't explain most of the reports 
you know, when you have enough information, then there's this residue where the, the evidence quality is just way too low to, to know for sure what was going on. But that's it. You, you never end up with, oh, here is something that is clear, but we don't know what it is, right? We never, you, there's never any of that, and, right? Same thing with Bigfoot or anything. You never end up with, here's a creature and we have no idea what it is. It's always just a blurry photo. So the bottom line, as you know, the skeptical community predicted when this UF, most recent UFO flap happened, this is a big, giant nothing burger. No evidence, nothing alien, no government cover-up. There's nothing. There's nothing but a circle of UFO believers promoting their own beliefs, promoting their own services, sometimes making a lot of money doing so, but they have, they have nothing to show for it. Absolutely nothing. Uh, and this is part one of the report. Part two is coming out, I think, later this year, maybe in September. So we'll see what else that they come up with. But once again, there's simply no there there. There's no, no evidence of alien phenomena. All righty. All right. That's that. Which will convince... Absolutely no one. No. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> it can't help but try. Yeah. Now, what are you going to do? I mean, again, I get it. The government's saying the government's not hiding aliens. But again, that's in the context, though, that's important because they're saying that the government is hiding aliens, right? Right. So, but who are they hiding it from and who is doing it and how is this all working? Like, there's no coherent story here. Uh, again, it's just, you know, hearsay, you know, and mystery mongering. Um, and you know, a lot of misinterpreted, misinterpreted things like innocent statements, like I misinterpreted, like the the Rumsfeld statement about right. we can't track two point three million, two point three trillion dollars. They lost it. No, they don't lose it. They just they don't have the tracking software for it, or whatever. Their systems are outdated. Um, but yeah, these these guys are grifters, you know. They, and they the most recent you know hoodwinking of. Uh, of the public and, you know, basically trotting out the same tired old UFO stories that have been, de been debunked over and over again. The thing is, this is one of the topics that I've been involved with closely for 50 years. Like when I was 10 years old, I was interested in UFOs and I started out as a believer. You know, I thought, oh yeah, there's so much being reported on TV and by adults, you know, that I thought there's, okay, there's clearly there's something is going on here, right? Um, and then by the, but by the time I was like 18, 19, 20, so first of all, even as somebody who wanted to believe and was fascinated in things like, you know, potential that aliens could be visiting the earth, it was also pretty clear that there wasn't any smoking gun evidence, right? Because obviously if there were, that's the only thing anybody would be talking about, right? If there was anything really definitive, but the whole UFO community creates this sense that while well, we're a about to have definitive evidence, right? It's 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 coming. You know, we're going to find the smoking gun. There, there's going to be a revelation. Right? There's going to be the equivalent of the leak of the Pentagon Papers, like the Snowden report. You know, something like that's going to happen, or somebody's going to be in the right place at the right time with a camera or a video, or whatever. And it's you know it's we're, we're going to build a case until it gets undeniable, right? But of course, that never happens. It never happens. So ten years later, I mean, like my, I'm now I'm like twenty years old, and it's like, yeah, it just becomes much, much less interesting. You know, when it's like the same kind of like you're on the edge of your seat waiting for something to happen for ten years, and then really all it took was for Carl Sagan to say, "And the evidence is crap." You know, like. After all this time, there isn't one unambiguous photo. And you're like, yeah, yeah, you kind of, that's right. You can't deny that. Like, it just, the, it, it, how, how is it that after all this time, right? So now that I'm talking like in 1980, um, and you're talking about going back to the 1940s, right? So you're talking about 40 years of the, the modern UFO phenomenon. And... It's just, it's the same old stuff. And they, they had no one's, it hasn't been growing. It hasn't been evolving. It's just the same old, you know, shell game over and over again. Now we're 40 years later. You know, another 40 years has gone by. 
It's like essentially 80 years of this UFO phenomenon, and they have nothing to show for it. There still isn't one unambiguous piece of evidence. Nothing. And they're still trotting out the same old stories over and over again, the same excuses, the same lame arguments, the same con you know, conspiracy mongering. It's the same stuff with n zero to show for it. Um, you know, that, th th I do think that's why UF, you know, fascination with UFOs tends to cycle. It has about a 10 to 20 year cycle, 10 to 15 years or whatever. Basically one generation. Because you know, essentially people get fascinated with UFOs and then they grow tired of it because there's nothing happening, right? There's the big reveal never comes. Yeah. And so then they lose interest, you know, then, but you have, the, of course, the core believers keeping the flames alive. And then a new generation comes out, and they're like, oh, look at this shiny new thing we've never seen before. It's like, oh, okay, here we go again, right? Then, there's an, and then you have another five years or so or whatever of interest in UFOs, and then that generation will become tired of it, and it'll fade into the background again. But then it'll come back again later. You know, in 10 years, 15 years, we'll be going through the same thing all over again. It'll be the same lame, blurry photos, the same, you know, ridiculous claims. Etc. That that's it. It's just they're just chasing their tail. It's never going anywhere because it's not real, <laughs> right? If it were real, that's not what would be happening. And it's the same for so many things, right? Um, if there was a government, you know, conspiracy to kill JFK, like I I know um, what's his name? The guy who wrote the book Case Closed. I forget his name. He said, yeah, you know. Like five years after the JFK was assassinated, you kind of had a point. You could say, we don't really know, and the government could be covering up. But 50 years after, no, you don't get to say that because it's a totally different ball game now because keeping that kind of secret over multiple administrations and multiple generations and all everything that that would entail is just becomes impossible. It's the same thing. Like the government's been covering up UFOs for 80 years. Come on. Like maybe in the 1940s or into the 1950s, you could say, yeah, the government found some stuff and they're, they're keeping it under wraps. But 80 years later, no way. It's impossible. And also it becomes nonsensical. Yeah, Gerald Posner. Why would they keep, why would they keep it secret for so long? Well, any administration could say, hey, the, the last administration is keeping this from you, but we're going to reveal this information. And why not? Well, you know, at this point in time, there's like what the motivation is just makes no sense. It's just nonsensical. The idea is the public's not ready for this information. It's just stupid. <laughs> hmm? Come on. You know, again, maybe in the 1940s, they could, you, could, you could say that. But in 2024, you're going to say the public is not. They already believe it. I mean, and most people already believe it. How can you simultaneously say that and that they're not ready, you know, to believe that we're being visited by aliens. You know, it, again, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, yeah, so time is the ultimate enemy of all these, you know, grand conspiracy theories, and um, and people just get tired of them, you know, because it's like, you know, Charlie Brown and the football. I mean, you know, <laughs> you can only be on the edge of your seat waiting for that other shoe to drop for so long <laughs> before you move on to the next thing. Uh, but they always come back they never, because there's a new generation of people who are naive to it, you know. That's part of what we do in the skeptical community. Part of our job is to be institutional memory for all of these things. And, and I've been doing this now for long enough where I've seen it happen in many contexts, not just UFOs, many things. Everything that was like completely debunked in the 1980s comes back around again, like in the 2000s. Okay. You have people, you know, saying, oh, repressed memories. Like, oh, here we go again. Nope, we've been through that. The evidence is crap. It doesn't exist. It can't happen. It's just, this is, this is how people fall into this false belief or whatever. Um, whatever it is. Like, it, it, you know, we have to be the, the institutional memory for all of these things. Like, it's like the immune system, right? We've been there before. We can respond with a very rapid, you know, counter, you know, reaction when these claims start to come out. You know, we've already thought our way all the way through it. We know what all the major malfunction is, like how they're getting things wrong. Um, you know, when they they bring up cases, we say, oh, that, here we go. It's already been pre-debunked. Here you go. Here's the information. Um, so I don't know how much of an effect it has ultimately. Hopefully it shortens the cycle, you know. 
or at least it, you know the media, the mainstream media, you know, has some skeptical experts to go to when they decide that that's not something they should do, when they bother. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it's never never going to go away entirely. You know, fifty years from now they'll be trotting out the same old yeah. tired nonsense. Just got to keep the pedal to the metal. Yeah, <laughs> it's an endless game. Endless. <laughs> um, and again, no one would be happier than me if, like, first of all, if aliens were visiting the Earth, I would want to know about it, right? I would want to know the truth, mm -hmm. whatever that is. As a science communicator, if I thought it really was happening, that would be a massive story, you know, right? I could make my career revealing something if I really thought that the evidence supported that conclusion. Making that case would be massively beneficial to my career, so I would have everything to gain. Uh, but the thing is, if it's not true, then that, of course, would be devastating to my reputation if I went out promoting a belief that was not true. So the most important thing for me, first of all, I personally, I want to know the truth. And as a communicator, I, want, I better make damn sure I'm doing my due diligence and, and if I'm, that what I'm saying is supported by logic and evidence. Uh, here it's not a it's not a tough call. It is not a tough call. There is nothing there. There's just no alien phenomenon happening. Um, the psychocultural hypothesis is totally kicking the ass of the alien hypothesis when it comes to UFO phenomena. All right, All I right. think that's enough. Any other last minute questions before we stop for before today? We do, 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 do. And then we'll be back next week again, mm -hmm. um, probably earlier. This week was a little late start. Yeah, we had a late start today because we had personal stuff to do. But yeah, usually we start around like 12, 12.30. 12 12 yeah. 30. We'll try to do that since it seems like people like that on their lunch break or something to that effect. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll have a Friday live stream. Yeah, I'm available. Week. We'll have to check with everybody. Yeah, I think it should be good. Critical thinking is key. That's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I think that's it. We'll see you all next week or Friday. Yep. Same Bye, everyone. Channel. Thanks, Ian. Bye-bye.